So starting with some basics of the green card. Green card is equivalent to permanent resident status. So the green card is the actual card you receive that shows that you are a lawful permanent resident of the U.S. Uh, being a permanent resident allows you to live and work in the U.S. permanently, um, pretty much what the, the name says. Um, it also is a pathway to citizenship in the U.S. After five years of being a permanent resident, you are generally eligible to apply for naturalization, um, which means uh, citizenship for you. Um, that is uh, shorter for pe people married to U.S. citizens, but for most people who are uh, becoming a permanent resident, that five-year timeline is what you can expect. Um, at, as you apply for citizenship, once you're granted that, that's when you can apply for a U.S. passport, for example. Um, the U.S. does allow dual citizenship, so you don't necessarily need to give up the citizenship you have from your own country, uh, but not all countries allow for dual citizenship. So you would want to check with um, you know, any other country that you of which you are a citizen to be sure that you would be able to maintain dual citizenship if that's something you want to do. Um, in terms of permanent residency, it is permanent, so um, it is permanent. Uh, not the norm to lose your permanent residency status, but it can happen. Um, serious crimes would be one way to uh, have your permanent resident status revoked. Uh, also abandonment. If you are a permanent resident, you're expected to reside primarily in the U.S. If you um, move outside the U.S., take up residence in another country, the government can determine that you've abandoned your permanent residence in the U.S. and basically revoke your green card at that point. Um, but for most people who intend to reside in the U.S. permanently, the green card is going to allow you to do that. Broadly speaking, there are two steps to uh, any green card process. The first is going to be an I-140. Um, and just to be clear, the I-140 is the employment-based okay. option. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Uh, but there is also the I-130, which is a family-based option. So um, there can be al alternative steps to the, the um, process here. But for the purposes of, of this uh, presentation where you're all postdocs and um, you know looking to apply for permanent residency through uh, your career and your uh, achievements in your career, uh, the I-140 is the form that you file. Uh, the I-140 can cover a variety of different categories, including EB1A, EB1B, EB2 National Interest Waiver, EB2 PERM, all of which we're going to talk about today. Um, and then some are eligible for premium processing. We'll talk about that a little bit more, too. Uh, the second step of the green card process is the I-485. You can think of that as kind of the actual application for the green card. It's where you're seeking to adjust your status from whatever your current status is, F1, J1, H1B, whatever, to lawful permanent resident um, and actually receive your green card. Um, one of the things we'll talk about a little bit more is that you have to have a current priority date to file your I-485. Um, we'll talk about what that means. Um, and just something to keep in mind, if you're on J-1 and you're subject to a two-year residency requirement, um, you may be uh, required to obtain a waiver before you're eligible to file the I-485. But those are the two broad steps, the I-140, where you're seeking to qualify under a specific category, and then the I-485, where you're actually applying for the green card. We're going to focus on the I-140 part today, um, and we're going to go over a couple of the uh, common areas that you might wish to apply through to get a green card. I'm going to start with the EB1A here. Uh, the EB1A is also called the Extraordinary Ability uh, Pathway. Um, it is uh, one of the most desirable pathways to a green card um, for reasons we'll, we'll get into, uh, but it is the most difficult as well. Um, approval rates for EB1A cases are lower than they are for any other category. Um, Generally speaking, you know, the requirements are that you be at the top of your field and that you stay in claim. Now, in practice, um, you know, those are broad categories that can be satisfied a lot of different ways. Um, but the real benefit to the EB1A is it allows you to file uh, without employer sponsorship. So you do not need an employer to sponsor you. You can self-petition an EB1A. Um, and that is one of the big benefits of the EB1A. So Talking about the EB1A being the most difficult, what are the actual requirements here? 
Uh, well, first of all, you could demonstrate that you have received a major internationally recognized award. A Nobel Prize would be an example of that. Um, probably that's not going to apply to most people, and that's okay. Um, most of our clients do not have a major internationally recognized award. In fact, I can only think of maybe one or two ever who have. So for the most part, people are going to go through the alternate pathway where we have 10 available criteria. You have to show that you satisfy at least three of those criteria. Um, I will quickly go through all of those criteria so you can start thinking about how they might apply to your case. Um, but the thing, the key to keep in mind is you need to satisfy three of these 10 available criteria. Uh, so the first one is award. Um, showing that you have received a lesser nationally or internationally recognized award. So this would be a step down from that Nobel Prize level. They do still need to be um, important awards. Uh, they should be um, competitive. Uh, they should be something that is uh, reflective of your excellence in the field. Um, so a travel award to attend a conference would not be an example, um, but a major dissertation award, for example, could be um, something that could satisfy the awards criterion. Um, being the recipient of a major funding grant uh, is something that could work. Um, those are a couple of ideas, but you know the, the types of awards that could qualify are going to vary a lot from case to case. So um, it's really just was this an award for excellence in your field? Um, is it a competitive award? And how can we show how competitive it is? You know, if you're one of uh, 500 people who applied and you're the only person who won, that's probably going to be a pretty good award uh, for us to be able to claim. Um, the second one is memberships. Memberships is one of the most difficult, I would say. The membership has to require outstanding achievement of of its members. So any uh, organization to which you pay dues and that's enough to get you membership, that's not going to be sufficient here. Uh, likewise, if the membership is based on a certain number of years of experience and maybe education level, that is probably not going to be enough. What these memberships need to need to be to qualify is um, something above and beyond. Just oh, sorry about that. Uh, above and beyond. Got it. Uh, above and beyond the, what would be expected of somebody at your education and experience level. Um, so, uh, you know, an example that I see pretty frequently, IEEE senior member, for example, that's kind of a borderline case where a lot of the times the amount of experience you have can qualify you for IEEE senior membership, but an IEEE fellow is definitely based on outstanding achievements in your field. So. It's something that can be very difficult for people early in their career to satisfy this criterion. Um, so I, I'll be honest, it's not claimed often, but it is a potential option depending on your specific credentials. Uh, the next one here published articles written about others, uh, written by others about your work. Um, so these would be media reports about your work. Uh, the big key here, I would say, number one, is that it needs to be external and independent. So if your university releases a press release about your work, that's not going to be sufficient. Um, it should be somebody external from your work that is has taken notice of your work and is commenting on it. The second big key is it needs to be a major publication. So the bigger, the better here. Uh, the New York Times featuring your work excellent. Uh, but even something like uh, a major journal in your field that writes a commentary about your work, for example, could be something that works for this published articles criterion. The fourth one here is probably the one of the two that we claim most often, and that's judge of the work of others. Uh, the reason why is this is a pretty black and white criterion that can be satisfied very simply. If you have done peer review work, uh, for journals or conferences in your field, you're going to be able to show that you have judged the work of others and you'll satisfy this criterion. 
for a lot of academic researchers, um, people who have postdoc experience, this is part of that experience, and it's very easy to do a few peer reviews and qualify for this criterion. So um, I would say, you know, if you have peer review experience, you're going to be in good shape for that. If you don't, and an EB1A is in your future, um, it's something that you probably want to seek out experience for, because this is one of the easiest criteria to satisfy. The fifth one is original contributions of major significance. Um, this one is focused very much on what you have done and what the impact of that work is. So it's not sufficient that you have made a novel discovery or some other type of original contribution. You have to show that the field recognizes it as majorly significant. And this can be very challenging. Um, I will say that the best predictor of success here tends to be citations. Um, USCS is not the officers reviewing your case are not going to be experts in your field. They're not going to be able to read your work and understand if it's significant or not. So they look to how other people in your field receive your work, how other experts receive your work. And citations are a very easy way for them to do that. Uh, so the number of citations you have can correlate very highly with uh, your chances for successfully claiming this specific criterion. That's not the only way to do it. Other things can be like implementation of your work. If you have a patent and that patent has been licensed, uh, that can be a good way to show that somebody has found your work majorly significant. Um, but for most people working in academia, citations are gonna be a really strong point there. Number six is the other most commonly claimed criterion along with judge of the work of others. This is uh, authorship of scholarly articles in your field. So. Um, if you're a postdoc, publication is probably pretty much expected in your position. You're probably authoring articles in journals or conferences. That's going to be sufficient to satisfy this criterion. So for most people who are academic researchers who are in a postdoc position, judge of the work of others and authorship of scholarly articles, those are going to be the two easiest. And the real key is finding that third strong criterion. We can always claim more than three, uh, but you know, having at least three that are very strong to claim is going to be your, your best bet for an EB1A. Um, the other two here uh, are critical role and high salary. Um, critical role is typically done, is typ typically proven through letters from your employer or other organizations to which you've contributed. Um, so Either your role will be leading, for instance, if you're getting offered a position as CEO of a startup company, that could be a leadership position. Um, as a postdoc, obviously postdoc is not a leadership position, but your role can be critical. If, for instance, your advisor uh, has a big major NIH grant and you are contributing to that and your advisor will give you a lot of credit for the contributions to that work, that can be a way that your work is critical uh, such that it allows you to satisfy this criterion. Um, so this is one that we do like to claim a lot. I think it's easy to claim, uh, not necessarily easy to get it approved, but there's a lot of situations where we can claim leading or critical role, um, even for people relatively early in their career. Uh, and then the last one here, high salary. Um, Typically for an EB1A, we're going to be looking for 90th percentile or higher uh, compared to people in a similar position. Uh, again, for a postdoc, that can be very challenging, uh, but if you're getting a job offer in the future um, and they're willing to pay you a higher salary than is the norm, that's definitely something we can highlight and claim here. There are two others. I said there were 10 criteria. The other two are primarily focused on artists, um, so don't have as much relevance here, uh, but I'll just mention them really quickly. Display of, of your work at artistic exhibitions or commercial success, um, things like um, record sales, box office numbers, things like that. Okay, so like I said, people really like the EV1A. A lot of people want to go for the EV1A. And the reasons why are there are a lot of benefits to the EB1A. Um, it's self-petitioned. You do not need an employer to sponsor you, which means you're in control of it. Uh, no specific job offer is required, which means you have a lot more employment flexibility. If you change jobs during the EB1A process, as long as you're working in your field of expertise, that's not going to be a problem at all. 
uh, no PERM labor certification is required. So we're not going to be testing the labor market to determine whether there's eligible U.S. workers here. Um, you get to skip all of that stuff, and that is a major advantage to the EB-1A. Um, it is eligible for premium processing, so you can pay an additional fee and receive a decision in just 15 business days. Uh, that is very attractive to a lot of people. But the biggest reason is that there are backlogs for a lot of the different categories, particularly for people born in India and China. And for that reason, the EB-1A is the most desirable because green card backlogs are shorter for the EB-1 category. Right now, to give you some idea, I think China's EB-1 backlog is about one year. Uh, India's is about three and a half years. Um, those are much shorter than the backlogs in the EB-2 or EB-3 range. So um, that's really the reason why people are interested in the EB-1A is it's going to be the quickest pathway to a green card for many people. The trade-off is, like I said, it's the most difficult to get approved for. Um, so we always want to be thinking about balancing those two things. Um, and EB-1A is going to be the end goal for a lot of people, but it might not be where you want to start your green card journey just because it is so difficult. Moving on to the EB-1B, very similar category to the EB-1A in a lot of ways, but there are some key differences. Um, the EB-1B is for people who are classified as outstanding researchers, which means you've received international recognition for your outstanding achievements in your area of expertise. Um, the EB-1B does have to be employer sponsored. So that's the big difference between EB-1A and EB-1B is your employer must file an EB-1B for you. You cannot file it yourself. Um, depending on who your employer is, there are specific employer requirements as well. Um, if your employer is an institute of higher education, for instance, Duke, um, it's very easy to, for the employer to qualify for an EB-1B. But if the employer is an industry, a uh, private company, they need to be able to show that they have uh, documented achievements in the field. So it can't be like a startup with no real credentials yet. It has to be a more established company. They also have to have at least three full-time researchers. So it can't be a small company where you're the only person doing research. It has to be a larger company where research is a kind of a fundamental part of the what the company does. Um, for you individually, there is also an additional require, requirement that you have to have at least three years of experience in teaching or researching your field. Um, that's going to be fairly easy for most people who have gone through a postdoc. You can count uh, time spent towards your PhD program in this experience. So we usually don't have too much trouble with that, but something to keep in mind. Uh, the EB-1B requirements are very similar to the EB-1A, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, basically, the way to think of them is they're like the EB-1A, but slightly easier. Um, so USCIS tends to adjudicate the EB-1B less strictly than an EB-1A. So even when the criteria are described very similarly, USCIS is more generous in who they approve for an EB-1B. So you can kind of see the criteria here are basically identical. There's just fewer criteria available for an EB-1B. Um, so the big advantage to an EB-1B is that uh, it has the same short backlogs as an EB-1A, but it's easier to get approved. That's what people really like about an EB-1B. The trade-off is that you're subject to the whims of your employer. Um, your employer has to file the case on your behalf. You don't get a say in when it's filed. They get to decide that. Um, and that's very relevant if you want to file quickly and your employer is not prioritizing it. You might have to wait for them. If you change jobs or lose your job, you're also going to have to start the I-140 process over again. Um, you need to stay with the same employer throughout the green card process for an EB-1B with some minor exceptions, but generally speaking, you should plan to be working for that employer throughout the entire green card process. If you change employers, you're going to be starting back at the beginning again. So it's an easier process than the EB-1A. It has the same short backlogs as EB-1A, but there are some downsides related to your employment flexibility there. So moving on to a third category is the EB-2 National Interest Waiver, or NIW. 
Um, the NIW is another very common category to apply under and has a lot of advantages. Um, so we're going to um, spend a little bit more time diving into the details of this. Um, so basically the idea with the NIW is that your work is so important and you're the right individual to be doing that work that we're going to waive the typical job offer requirements of an EB2. Um, so because of that, the EB2 like EB2 NIW, like the EB1A, is self-petitioned. Uh, it does not require an employer's support at all. It does not require a job offer, and it does not require a labor certification. So it's very similar to the EB1A in those ways. The NIW requirements are much different, however, whereas EB1A and EB1B have very strict you know, here are the 10 or seven criteria that are available for you. The NIW, the requirements are much broader. Uh, there are really two requirements here with a third kind of uh, balancing test at the end. Uh, the first requirement is that your proposed work have both substantial merit and national importance. Um, that is, frankly, a pretty easy thing for most people working in STEM fields to meet. Um, and most researchers in general are able to show that their work has, has both substantial merit and national importance. Um, you know, people doing academic research, their work is becoming publicly available through publication and presentation. Um, that's going to make it pretty easy to argue that the work has substantial merit and national importance. So for people who are postdocs who have done academic research, where we're really focusing in is usually that second requirement, that you are well positioned to advance your proposed endeavor. Um, so that means that you're the right person to keep doing this work. Not only is your work important, but you're the one that should be doing it in the U.S. Um, and they look to a variety of factors for that. Things like your past success. Uh, so if you have publications, citations, if you've won awards for your work, if you received media attention, a lot of the same things that we highlighted in the EB1A uh, and EB1B categories are applicable here as well but it's a much broader requirement that you're trying to satisfy here, that you're well positioned to advance your proposed endeavor. Uh, there's also some forward-looking aspects to this. So what do you plan to do in the future? Do you have funding set up? Do you have a job offer? Job offer is not required, but it can be very helpful here. Um, do you have a well thought out plan for how you're going to continue your work? Is there interest in your work from other people in the field? All of these things are potential factors here. So the nice thing about the NIW is there's a lot of different ways to satisfy these requirements. And that makes it a, uh, I don't want to say easier, but more realistic option for a lot of people. Um, the, the NIW really gives a lot of different people ways to satisfy the requirements, whereas the EB1A and EB1B, they're very regimented, they're very strict, and that can narrow the group of people who are eligible to be successful there. Like I said, the third requirement here is kind of a balancing test. It's really just saying, all right, taking into account all the factors here, is it in the national interest to give you a green card? Um, frankly, this is not really ever challenged if the first two requirements are met, so we don't focus it on it a ton, but it's good to know it's there. Uh, so the advantages of the NIW. Of all the categories we've talked about so far, the NIW is the easiest to get approved for, um, significantly easier than both the EB1A and EB1B. So it's the place where a lot of people want to start their green card journey. Um, like the EB1A, it is self-petitioned. You do not need an employer. Uh, like the EB1A, no job offer is required. So you have employment flexibility. If you change jobs throughout the NIW process, that's not a problem so long as you keep working in your field. And no perm labor certification is required to test the job market. Um, it is also eligible for premium processing. This is relatively new. Uh, about a year ago, the NIW became eligible for premium processing. So that can speed up the process a little bit. Um, but really the main advantage to the NIW, the easiest to get approved and the most flexible um, to, to allow the most people to get approved. Um, 
That said, green card backlogs have been getting longer in the EB2 category. And so that is why the EB1s are becoming more attractive to a lot of people. The EB2 is not going to be the quickest pathway to a green card. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I, I do recommend starting your green card journey earlier and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, with that said, I wanna turn it over to Natalia, who's gonna talk a little bit about the PERM processes. Thanks so much, Andy. Yes, this is Natalia Soron from Ellis Porter. I'm going to talk about everything else. So pretty much if you're not uh, doing something extraordinary, if you're not doing something in the national interest, and if you're not an outstanding researcher, there are still ways to getting a green card if you can get an employer to sponsor you. So you might just be a rock star with your current employer, and if they're willing to take the leap of, of sponsoring you for permanent residency, you can go through the PERM process little more labor intensive, does require an employer to sponsor you, but it's for a future position. So you're not necessarily locked in your current role. It also comes with an I-140 component, but the initial part is the PERM and you have to get through the PERM process, get through an approved I-140, and then you might be more portable to other employers. So it doesn't have as much flexibility because you would have to restart the PERM process with a new employer if you did leave after the I-140 was approved, but before you were eligible for the green card application, the 485. And with the PERM process, you can be in either EB2 or EB3 preference category. The EB2 preference category covers those that work um, in roles that require a minimum of a master's degree or higher. And then everything else, it could be a skilled worker or those with just a bachelor's degree or in a role that just requires a bachelor's degree, um, that would be under the EB3 preference category. And the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about why it's important for the preference categories. But with this process, there is a, an, an option to do premium processing on the I-140 as well to somewhat expedite the uh, the entire process. But the very first step is, is, again, the most labor intensive and just requires the employer to be involved. And you have to do what's called a labor market test. So you would actually be testing the U.S. market to see if there are any willing, able, and qualified U.S. workers to do the job that your employer is sponsoring you for. And currently, the, the processing time for you know th these different stages of the process, um, there there are longer. So um, you do get the expedited premium processing service on the I-140, but that first step, the PERM process, is not. Uh, and there's no way to expedite in, in between there. So if you can get the employer to sponsor you, go through the PERM process. Ten to twelve months will get you through probably the first, the kind of the sub step of getting a prevailing wage determination and doing the recruitment stage. But we have seen that there are longer processing times, even up towards the eighteen to twenty-four months, if you need to get that PERM certification. So just another sub step of the PERM process. So you, you do want to um, get started sooner than later because that could get through um, to get through these certain stages. You you need at least a couple year lead time. And um, again, if you want to think about EB2 versus EB3, is it advantageous to you? Think about your country of birth, and then that will kind of drive when you will be able to file for that last step of the green card process. So even if you've got the approved I-140, you might be sitting, if you're from India or China, for several more years before you're eligible for that last step of the, the green card process, the AOS. But that's okay, because it, it maybe will buy you some time, depending on your non-immigrant uh, visa classification and things like that. So check these bulletins pretty regularly. Every month they could stay the same, go backwards, retrogress, or, or move forward. But then you just look at, is it EB2 or EB3? Again, the EB2 for the NIW is great, but there is EB2 for PERM. Again, a little bit longer, but overall will be um, the same bulletin that you'll be looking at, uh, regardless of how you get there. Thanks, Natalia. Um, so I see some questions in the chat. We're going to get to those in just a moment. Uh, but the one thing I wanna kind of um, finish with here is a common question that we get is with, and that's when to file my case. Um, the real short answer here is start the green card process as soon as you can. Um, what we have seen over the past two years is really unprecedented demand for green cards. And that has uh, made backlogs larger than ever before. Um, so there are a, there's a limit to the number of green cards that are available each year. Um, there is a limit to employment-based green cards specifically, and then there are limits for each category, EB1, EB2, EB3. They all have their limits. 
Within those categories, each country has limits as well. So we talked about India and China um, having particularly long backlogs because they have more applicants than any other country. Um, so these backlogs are becoming a real problem. Um, right now, uh, even in the EB2 category for people born anywhere, your wait's gonna be over a year before you can move on to the second step in the green card process. So more than ever, um, starting the green card process early is really, really important. Um, and I notice I just have a typo. Uh, uh, the India EB1 backlog date is May, March 1st, 20, 2021, uh, not 3031, which is a, a long way away. Um, but yeah, even if you're India or China, I would strongly urge you to start considering an EB2 very soon. Um, you might not want to stay in the EB2 line. You might be hoping for an EB1 someday. But one of the nice things is you can transfer your place in line between multiple petitions. So the, the technical term is priority date. Uh, your priority date is the date you file your first I-140 so long as it's approved. That is your priority date for any subsequent petition as well. So if you do an NIW today and two years later you do an EB1A, your priority date from the NIW transfers over to the EB1A and you've just saved yourself two years of waiting right there. So I strongly urge everyone who is considering permanent residency in the US to get started as soon as possible. Um, the, you know, the longer you wait, you know, you might wait a year to file and that might delay your case by several years, the way we're seeing things back up and demand increase right now. So um, yeah, I, I really urge everyone, not just from India and China, anyone from any country that wants a permanent residency in the US, the sooner you start the process, the better off you're going to be. So we're going to take some questions here. I see a bunch in the chat already. Feel free to keep sending them. We'll just kind of work our way through them. You can also uh, hop uh, on the mic and, and ask questions directly if you'd like. And while we do that, I'm just going to throw up our contact information. Um, any case-specific questions or like individual-specific questions, we're not really going to be able to answer here. I would definitely encourage people to reach out to us. We're happy to evaluate your case, to talk through your specific situation, see how we can help. Uh, but I, I'm happy to answer kind of the big picture questions that I'm seeing here. Um, so first question I see uh, for an EB1B, what if I transition from postdoc to faculty in the same institution? Is that allowed? That's a really good question. Generally speaking, a promotion during the EB1B process should not be a problem so long as your job is essentially the same. So if you went from a postdoc position that was primarily research and you got a faculty position that's primarily research, I would not be concerned about that for an EB1B. That's probably going to be fine. But if the faculty position were strictly teaching, that would be an issue because you're really not continuing your work. You're not in the same type of position. Um, so that's kind of the key thing to keep in mind there. Uh, another question, are nurses and physical therapists able to apply for the NIW? Uh, yes, but with caveats. Um, so... One weird thing about the NIW is that purely clinical work cannot qualify for the NIW requirements. Um, so if you are a nurse or a physical therapist with a research component to your work, you could potentially qualify for an NIW. If your work is purely clinical, if you're just you know dealing with patients, that's not going to work for an NIW. Um, the explanation is kind of odd, uh, but this has been a kind of a long-standing rule where uh, the government just says, if you're treating patients, those patients benefit, but the nation, uh, the U.S. as a whole does not benefit from that. Um, and because of that, we're not going to approve you for an NIW. So that research component is very important for, um, for nurses, for physical therapists, for physicians. Um, having a research component to your work is really critical for an NIW. Uh, could you please explain briefly the lawyer's role in the green card NIW process? Is it just consulting or is more involved? Um, I can only speak to what our firm does, but I'm happy to do that. Um, for the NIW, 
uh, we try to make the process as simple as possible for you, take as much of the work off of your plate as possible. Um, the big thing we do is we draft a legal brief that's going to explain every piece of evidence we're submitting and why it shows you qualify for the specific uh, cat, the specific category that you're applying under. For an NIW, that's going to be showing that you satisfy those three requirements. Um, we're also going to work with you to collect all of those documents. We review the documents, make sure they look good, make sure nothing's missing. Uh, we complete your forms for you to sign so you don't have to worry about making sure you're putting the right information in every place. Um, we print everything out and mail it out, so save you a trip from the FedEx store or USPS, whatever. Um, if you, your case gets a request for evidence, if, if the government decides they need more evidence from you, we help strategize about how we get that evidence. We prepare a response to it, just the same as we did the legal brief up front. Um, so it's a lot more than consulting. It, you know, consulting is definitely part of it. We definitely uh, want to help our clients understand how the process works, um, how it might interact with their non-immigrant visa status, um, but yeah, we're definitely very involved. And I, I would say because there is such a legal aspect to all of these case types, it's really beneficial to have a lawyer who is experienced and knows how to handle these cases to make sure you're presenting your case in the best light possible. Um, to give you an example, NIWs across the board for all of USCIS, NIWs are approved at a rate of about 70%. Um, our firm has a 98% approval rate. So, you know, I, I think that speaks to the difference of hiring an attorney, somebody that knows what they're doing. The NIW is very achievable for a lot of people, but you have to prepare your case the right way. Uh, another question, does applying for a green card affect renewal of F1 OPT for the STEM extension? Uh, my general answer here is no. The I-140 should not affect your ability to apply for OPT or renew your OPT and get the STEM extension. Um, USCIS has issued guidance that explicitly states the I-140 is not considered a clear demonstration of immigrant intent, and therefore it should not impede your ability to get OPT and STEM. That said, it's always at the discretion of your school. Um, so it's good to talk to your school about that before saying anything definitively. They're the ones who grant o OPT in the STEM extension. So um, you wanna make sure they're on the same page. Uh, another question, comment on the diversity-based green card. Um, I'm going to say, or I'm not gonna say, I'm going to say I'm not going to comment on that too much here. I think that's a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, just suffice it to say the diversity-based green card is another option. I think the main drawback is it's a lottery-based system. So, um, you know, it's not based on your credentials. It's not based on anything you can control. It's a lottery. Um, it may very well be worthwhile to pursue a, a diversity green card in addition to an employment green card, but it's something that you can't necessarily rely on. So um, just an alternative pathway. If it's something you're interested in, we do have attorneys at Ellis Porter who can assist with that, uh, but it's a little bit outside of what Natalia and I handle. Uh, another question, I just filed my I-140 for an NIW. Does it make sense to expedite it if the backlog is January 2023? Um, so from a practical standpoint, no you're not getting any benefit from doing premium processing. Uh, because your priority date is the date you file your case, not when it's approved, getting an earlier decision is not really benefiting you. That said, it can be beneficial in that you have peace of mind of knowing the decision. Um, that's kind of a personal decision. Is it worth $2,805 just to know the decision? For some people, it might be. If you're very anxious about it, maybe you're willing to, to pay that. But the thing to understand is it's not going to benefit the actual green card process at all. It's not going to speed up that process for you. Let's see, another question, does the NIW require a J waiver? Uh, so the I-140, including the NIW, does not require a J waiver. If you are subject to the two-year residency requirement, you can file the I-140 and it can be approved. You just need the waiver before you move on to the second step, the I-485, which we didn't really get into a whole lot here today, but um, you can't actually apply for the green card until you have that waiver. So you can do the first step, not the second step. 
Uh, is it accurate that maintaining your current residence address is preferable when applying for a green card? I've heard that longer durations spent in a single residence are viewed more favorably. Is there any truth to that? Um, not that I know of. I don't know. Natalia, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I, I haven't heard any benefit to that. Um, I have folks that often relocate and it has been an issue, of course, for processing mail it could be a problem. But um, other than that, no, I, I don't think the government looks any more favorable towards folks that stay in one spot. Yeah, I, I think that's the real issue is that um, the mail doesn't get delivered to the right place. So uh, we generally make sure mail is coming to our office so that we are getting copies of everything. Um, so if you do move, um, shouldn't be an issue. We're getting copies of everything, even if it doesn't show up at your address. Uh, applying for a green card and international travel on a J-1 visa, what are the constraints and at what time points do they apply? So that's a good question. Um, generally speaking, the I-140 alone is not a clear indicator of immigrant intent. So it is possible to travel internationally on a J-1 after filing the I-140. That said, it is always up to the discretion of a border officer whether to admit you. And part of that determination is always going to be, are you entering to fulfill the purposes of your visa? For a J-1 visa, that includes having non-immigrant intent, intending to go back to your home country after the J-1 program is done, showing that you have sufficient ties to your home country. The I-140 can be a point that they consider there. So travel becomes riskier at the I-140 stage. And then I would say at the I-485 stage, the second step in the process, that's where you would not be able to leave the U.S. and travel with your J-1 visa. Um, so riskier at the first stage, not possible at the second stage is kind of the short answer there. Um, and so that's kind of the same question as the next one there. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in consulting on the NIW, uh, send me an email. Uh, my email address is up there, um, and I can get you set up with a link to uh, our evaluation form and get you in touch with the right people to get you evaluated for that. Uh, can you comment more on the EB2 backlog during which month do you usually expect an improvement? So, yeah, Natalia was kind of saying that the changes to the visa bulletin and changes to the backlog are very unpredictable. In any given month, dates can move forward, they can move backward, they can stay the same. Um, it's all based on supply and demand, and so it's very difficult to predict that demand ahead of time. Um, Right now for EB2 rest of world, which means basically everyone not including China and India, the backlog is like 16 months right now. Um, it has been slowly getting longer. It hasn't moved a ton over the past several months. So it's kind of gone from like 12 months to 16 months here. Um, typically when we do see the most forward movement is at the beginning of the new fiscal year when the number of visas resets. That happens October 1st. So October 1st is the beginning of USCIS's fiscal year. That is historically when most forward movement happens. Um, that can vary year to year. I think we were a little disappointed with how things moved this past October. It wasn't very significant. Um, so really the best advice I can have is file your EB2 as early as possible. That's the only real control you have over the situation. So that's kind of how you should approach it. Um, I see a question about a specific priority date um, and when you can file the I-485. I would say reach out to us. I think that's something we could handle better individually, gather some more information from you. Uh, should we keep a valid H-1 status through during the process? Um, so during the I-140 part of the process, yes, you need to maintain your non-immigrant status if you wish to continue living and working in the U.S., the I-140 does not provide any basis for staying in the U.S. It does not provide any basis for work authorization. Uh, only at the second stage of the process, the I-485, are you eligible to stay in the U.S. even if your non-immigrant status expires. Um, so once you file the I-485, you are authorized to stay in the U.S. You can also apply for employment authorization. That's probably gonna take six to eight months to come through. So it's definitely not immediate. So you're probably going to want to maintain your non-immigrant status there as well. Um, 
If you want to be totally safe, it's good to maintain your non-immigrant non status throughout the entire green card process if possible. If your case ends up getting denied, uh, even if your I-485 has been pending, if that 485 gets denied, you're going to be left with no way to stay in the U.S. if you've let, if you've let your non-immigrant status lapse. Um, so it's a good idea to maintain that status, if at all possible. There are times where it's just not possible, uh, but the I-485 stage is the only time where you would be able to stay in the U.S. if that lapsed. Uh, let's see. Is it permitted to have applications for multiple types simultaneously? Yes, it is. So you can pursue multiple uh, green card pathways at the same time. Um, I don't, it's not uncommon to see a person go through the EB2 perm process with their employer while also doing an NIW on their own, and then maybe doing an EB1 in the future. Um, there's no problem with that. They don't conflict at all. Let's see, I have, see a question here on the two-year residency requirement. Uh, it says my visa said the two-year uh, requirement doesn't apply. So in this case, if I need to apply for the waiver or not, um, my officer, visa officer told me it might be a mistake because everybody from China needs to follow the two-year rule. Yeah, um, the DS-2019 and the J-1 visas are not always correct. In fact, they're often incorrect. So you can't rely on them 100%. I would say if there's any question about whether or not you are subject to that requirement, you can request an advisory opinion from the Department of State. And I would recommend you do that so that you know and that you can address it early. Um, it is common for people from China to be subject to that two-year rule. So it may be a good idea to try to get an advisory opinion to clarify. Uh, how long does it take the I-485 to process? Um, and how much specific should we be on specifying our field? Uh, so I-485 processing, it's going to vary with the backlogs again. Uh, there are sometimes different dates for when you can file the I-485 and when the I-485 can actually be approved. My general guideline is six to 12 months, but that can be variable. Um, in terms of how specific to be when talking about your field, um, for a high-skilled petition like an NIW, for instance, we try to take a fairly broad view of your field to not restrict your uh, job possibilities too much. So if we say that your field is like a super specific area of, of research on like one specific topic, well, then if you take a job uh, doing anything else, you might be putting yourself at risk. On the other hand, if we define your field more broadly, something like, you know, for example, uh, you know, analytical chemistry or electrical engineering or, you know, molecular biology, broad field types that are like academic areas, that gives you a lot more flexibility in future employment. So if you change jobs and the topic of your research changes, that means you're going to not be as likely to have a problem. So we do tend to define the fields fairly broadly while still being sure that we're being specific enough to you know, have some value in that definition. Uh, after applying for an NIW, can we travel internationally for an H-1B or do we need to wait until approval? Um, so H-1B is probably the best visa type to be on uh, during the green card process, that and L-1. Uh, they are what's called dual intent visas, and because of that, they do not conflict with the green card process. So earlier when I was talking about J-1 and immigrant intent and risk of travel, none of that applies to an H-1B. Uh, for an H-1B, you can travel basically throughout the entire green card process without issue. Uh, so um, yeah, H-1B is a really good visa to have, um, going to make it a lot easier for you. How frequent is it to get a denial once the I-485 is pending? So if your I-140 is approved, I-485 denial is relatively uncommon um, and is usually something that you can kind of predict. So the most common reasons for an I-485 denial would be things like having a criminal record, uh, being a security threat to the U.S., having a communicable disease, um, having periods of um, 
being out of status in the U.S., being unlawfully present in the U.S., and being unable to support yourself financially. Um, so, you know, if those are things that apply to you, you you've got kind of some notice that the I-485 could be tricky. If not, for most people, the I-485 is going to be relatively straightforward. Lengthy, a long process, but relatively low risk of denial. Uh, what's the other option for nurses and physical therapists if they don't do research? You're probably looking at a PERM. If you do clinical work, you're going to want your employer to sponsor you for a PERM. Um, that's going to be your most likely pathway to a green card, I would say. Uh, let's see, British citizen on J-1 visa, uh, DS-2019 says not subject to two-year rule, going to be accepting a staff job at Duke, will I have an issue? Um, something you want to talk to Duke about, but probably not. If you're not subject to the two-year residency requirement, probably not going to be an issue for you. Uh, if I file an I-485 before matching into residency, should I still signal the programs that would sponsor an H-1B to help keep a valid visa status? Uh, you know, I think that's a personal decision. I, I don't think that there's necessarily a right answer. Like I said earlier, my general recommendation is, if possible, keep a non-immigrant status. Um, it's a good backup plan in case something happens where the green card process doesn't go through. That said, I definitely understand the realities that it could be hard to get an H-1B, it could be more challenging to match into the program you want if you're having to push for an H-1B. So I think it's, you know, a personal decision of, you know, are you willing to take a little bit of risk if the green card process goes the wrong way um, and you don't have anything to fall back on? Would you be willing to leave the U.S. in that case? You know, that's kind of the, de the decision making process you have to go through there. How long do you expect I have to wait for the whole process to have the green card on EB2 and IW if I file now? Um, so if you are not India or China, if you're born in any other country and you're doing an NIW, I would estimate two to three years for the entire green card process. That's always subject to change as these backlogs change. Can't predict whether those backlogs will get you know, longer in the future, but that's what I've been seeing recently is about two to three years to complete the whole green card process. Uh, can people in H-1B travel during the I-485 stage? Yep. Um, so again, that's the real benefit to an H-1B is you can travel throughout the entire green card process and shouldn't have an issue. Thank you so much, Andy and Natalia, for answering all the questions. Um, yeah. There is, I guess, one question that I, I saw. Um, so the question is about EB-1B. What does comparable research position refer to? Uh, any example? Uh, Probably referring to something on the slide, I guess. Maybe. Let me go back and see. EB1B? Comparable research position. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by that. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. I see comparable research position on the one of the slide I saw. It. Yeah. So, um, the the thing I would say, mm -hmm. um, what what I'm guessing that means is um, if you're looking to change jobs um, after doing an EB1B, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, so there is an exception that allows you to change jobs during the EB1B process. If you have filed your I-485 and it has been pending for 180 days or longer, so six months or longer. You can change jobs so long as you are changing into a job that is the same or similar as the job that was offered for the EB-1B. What does that mean? That's a very case-specific question. Um, basically, I would say the, the more similar the job is, the e easier time you're going to have making that argument that it's same or similar. The more different the job is, the riskier it's going to be that USCIS doesn't agree. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a very case by case determination, I think. Okay. Okay, there are two more questions called in. Um, how long yeah. will the MIW process take for people born in China? 
Yeah, so right now the backlog for China is about three and a half years, I believe, uh, for EB2. Um, so you're looking at three and a half years from the time you file the I-140 until you can file the I-485, and then another six to 12 months to get the I-485 decision. So four to five years would be my rough estimate there. And then um, yeah, what, what sponsorship documentation does the university need to provide for EB1B for a tenure line faculty position? Um, so that's probably the most straightforward scenario possible for an EB1B. Um, if your university is the sponsor, typically they need to sign the forms and they need to provide a letter talking about how they support your petition. That should really be all that's needed from the employer. It's a pretty easy process for them. And I did see one more come in. How long does it take to get a work permit after filing the I-485? Uh, six to eight months is kind of the general guideline I would give there. Uh, see, what does Schedule A mean for nurses and physical therapists? Um, I'm pretty rusty on Schedule A. Natalia, how are how are you feeling on that? Maybe a little bit better than rusty, but yeah. not uh, but not not that great. So um, I personally don't do them. We obviously have a healthcare team that focuses exclusively yeah. on healthcare professionals. Um, my enough knowledge to get me dangerous kind of a, a vibe would be there is a Schedule A process, so it it allows you to waive out of that perm process. So similar to NIW in the sense that you don't have to go through the perm process. If you are um, either a nurse or a physical therapist, there are some other um, ways you can do it in like admin positions, but you have to be patient facing. So uh, as far as I know that, I mean, that's, that's the key part of it. So if you're a physical therapist, you can possibly wave out of the perm and go through a schedule A um, I-140. And depending on the requirements for the role, it could be EB2 or EB3, but essentially it's just another route to getting back to that visa bulletin. So um, likely if you have a, at least a master's degree or higher, it's probably going to be EB2 and you just go through the same process. But with schedule A, you just have to prove that you're in this uh, field that allows for either nurses or physical therapists. Yeah. And like Natalia is... Yeah. Like Natalia said, we do have a healthcare team that handles Schedule A. Uh, we're not on that team, so we're not the subject matter experts on that. But um, if you'd like to reach out, we can definitely put you in touch with our healthcare team and they can give you some more information. I know we're out of time here. I'm just going to hit these last two questions really quick. Uh, if my contract ends during the NIW and I have to go back to my country, do I lose it all? No, the green card process can be done from outside the US, including if you move outside during the green card process. There is an alternative process to the I-485. It's called immigrant visa processing. It involves applying for an immigrant visa at the consulate. Uh, that immigrant visa allows you to enter the US and become a permanent resident. So leaving the US, uh, not necessarily a problem for your green card process. Um, and then while filing processing the I-140 or I-485, is it necessary to stay in the U.S. for H-4 dependent? Um, I am not sure I understand what the question is there, um, but I think we're out of time. So I would say email us with uh, any additional questions and we can definitely try to help out a little bit further. Okay, thanks so much, Andy and Natalia. Um, yeah, I guess you take the note of the email addresses and then shoot email. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for having right. us again. Thank you. Always all. a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Bye.